Hello, Learning Nerd Nation, and welcome on in to the nerdiest podcast you are going to hear today. My name is Dr. Luke Hobson. I am a senior instructional designer and program manager at MIT. I'm also the author of the book called What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer. And I make a lot of content on the internet all about instructional design because my passion is this field. I absolutely love what it is that I do, and I consider it my purpose to be able to help you along your own instructional design journey. Whether you're a newbie, and you just heard about instructional design, you're trying to figure out how to transition over into this field, or you're a veteran and you've been doing this for years and you just want to pick up a couple of different types of tips and tricks to make your own learning experiences better, all are welcomed on in to this show. And of course, you can find all my information over at drlukehompson.com. If you're watching this video, you can tell that this might be a bit of a different type of podcast episode because, folks, I have not yet had a fully all type of encompassing video podcast combination yet so far, but that changes today. I was looking to be able to bring on a guest who would be willing to do a different type of a video interview, and luckily for all of us, I found an amazing guest. I'm going to be talking about him a little bit later on, because today's episode is also very unique in nature because it was inspired from your questions. A bunch you wrote into me via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and of course over via email email at luke at drlukehompson.com and you asked me about your pressing instructional design questions and I gotta say folks these were awesome awesome questions such as what about if your organization doesn't do the A and D and Addy and you're just left to die what exactly do you do what if you're giving a type of an opportunity to be able to come on board as an institution and be able to train professors in e-learning should you actually take that job now of course we need to be able to talk about teachers because lots of teachers have questions pertaining to instructional design. We'll be covering about what exactly do you need in order to make this happen as far as for credentials, first steps, what can you use as part of your pieces for your portfolio? And the last question, which is super interesting and very learning nerd heavy, is talking about is Bloom's taxonomy the best way to be able to measure effectiveness of online discussion board postings? Really interesting stuff. Can't wait to dive on into this one. And of course, to be able to answer your questions, I wanted to bring on a guest who I respect very much so inside of the instructional design space. And I wanted to hear more from his perspectives about these very same types of questions. So allow me to introduce Tim McKean. He's an instructional designer over at Arizona State University. You've probably seen his types of postings before on LinkedIn and Facebook. He is extremely active in all of the groups online. And I can't wait. I'm so glad he was the first guest to be able to want to come in and do this type of a video podcast and answer all of your questions. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Here is our Q&A episode with the one and the only Tim McKean. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Luke. Absolutely, absolutely, man. I can't wait to do this. This one is going to be really cool. But before we dive on in, Tim, could you just please introduce yourself to the audience? Tell them a little bit more about who you are and what it is that you do. Great. I'm Tim McKean. I'm a senior instructional designer. Uh, for the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts at Arizona State University. And anything else, man, you do a lot more than that. Like, well, I know yeah, that's I do title, other things too, but, but <laughs> that's why I'm here. Yeah. No, I also do, uh, I freelance uh, audiobook and e-learning narration, and uh, I've been a teacher in, the, in a past life, a uh, musician, French horn. Uh, so there's, there's several things back there in my past, but right now, uh, right now it's ID. Fair enough. Fair enough. I was going to say, because Tim, I've known you for a while because of different Facebook groups and chatting about various things about instructional design over the years. So this is really cool because I know we've talked before about coming on to the podcast and now mm -hmm. you're getting the super uber version of the podcast slash YouTube channel version which awesome. is really cool for us to be able to do. So for the folks at home, I know that you've been listening to some of the podcast episodes that had the Q&A episode type of variety, and that is what we're going to be doing today. But what I always kept on thinking about in the background was, wouldn't it be really cool to bring on another instructional designer, get their perspectives, and then the two of us could actually tackle and go through the questions and answers together. And as I was thinking about this, Tim, you actually reached out saying, hey, hint, hint, I would love to come on the show. And I was like, there we go. <laughs> so that's what this episode is going to be, folks at home. So you have the full podcast episode, but also you are going to have 
this uh, YouTube version where you can actually go and watch as well. So this is what we are going to do. Uh, Tim and I, right now, we have four questions that you sent over to us via Facebook, LinkedIn, and then you can always send over a question to my email at luke at drlukehompson.com. But that's where all of these came from. So Tim, you ready to start diving on in and answering some questions and helping out some people? Absolutely. And I'm really curious to see uh, if we agree on these things or not, you know, what uh, what our different perspectives happen to be. I mean, I hope that we don't, which is kind of funny. It's just like <laughs> I don't want to, like I don't want to start a debate, obviously. But at the same time, the, if all the perfe- uh, perspectives are the same every single mm-hmm. time and it's just like eh, we're just copying each other. So right. I really hope that we actually have a variety. Not like we're going to go like fist fighting over Zoom, <laughs> but I think <laughs> that there's some be some really interesting takes here. So let's dive on into the first question. Yeah. So Tim, this is what it says. It says, hey, Luke, I've been following your YouTube channel for a while, and thanks for sharing the knowledge. I live in Brazil, and I'm a graduate in instructional design. Here I face a challenge that I don't know is a problem only in Brazil or worldwide. Businesses here don't do needs analysis at all. Addy means die. The A and the D steps just simply don't exist. They give the solution for the instructional design to make a course out of it. My question, what's the best way to approach leaders that don't want an analysis or design steps? I'm asking this because it looks like Brazil is a decade late in the instructional design field, and maybe there is already a good approach to manage those situations. Thanks again. So, Tim, I'll let you take the first question. What do you say to this one? Well, one of the first things that came to mind is that adage that uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, That that we tend to see a solution that fits our skill set. And it sounds like in this situation, this company maybe has instructional designers and uh, trusts them. And so, you know, they'll, they'll see a problem. They say, oh, we'll make a course to solve that problem. Um, and so, you know, that may be a thing I, in some ways that's a, that's a compliment, right? It's a, I know that you guys can solve problems and here's a problem that we have. So, you know, go solve it. Um, but the other aspect I was thinking of, of this one is that as an ID, um, and I know you've talked about this before as an ID relationship management is a huge part of what we do. Um, and so there is an aspect of, it is my job when when someone comes to me and says, "Hey, I've got this problem. Here's what, here's how I want to solve it." Uh, that I will say, "Sure, let's let's pursue that path." But have you also considered this, or have you you know thought about this tool, or have you? Um, so it's easy to make uh, suggestions, and uh, and whenever possible, making those kind of suggestions really really dig into to why. What's the benefit of this other thing? Uh, because if your company says they want a course on something, but you think like a job aid would solve the problem or a simple YouTube video, um, then that's actually going to be cheaper for them, right? So you could say, hey, we could solve this same problem at a fifth the cost if we tried something like this. Um, and that's going to get their attention, right? A fifth the cost, you know, that's that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so that's another thing too. If you if you have an idea, definitely present it as a suggestion or a um, you know, I really hate passive voice when I'm writing, but when I'm working with SMEs, that's, you know, that's how it is. Have you considered this? Or you might think about this, or I've seen other companies use this tool. Um, and so you can always throw out those suggestions and always anchor it with a, with a reason why it's going to be beneficial to them to think about that tool. Now, when you were thinking about answering this, one of the things that I saw right away that I was just like, hmm, I don't think I actually agree with that is that he was wondering um, if this was a Brazil problem or if it's an anywhere problem. I think it's an anywhere problem. It's Do you an think it's problem. OK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you, they're definitely definitely not a decade behind a decade ago. Uh, you know, if you had IDs, that was great, you know? (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I I know. It's just like so many of the people of the world are finally learning about who we are and what it is that we do now. So Mm -hmm. it's just like, no, I I don't think that they are really far behind. And, And for the most part, Tim, I definitely agree with many of the things that you said. What actually came to mind was this idea about how instructional designers can be seen as order takers. And I know when I talked with uh, Heidi Kirby a long time ago and she came on the podcast, she was talking about how she was just like, you can't just like 
take L and D and assume like you can just go and order up a pizza and then to say that I want this and this and this, and then like have it delivered to you. Right. Like, that's not how this works. <laughs> there needs to be a lot. The menu. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, no, there needs to be a lot more uh, pertaining to that. We are simply not just um, order takers here. So if I was in this person's shoes, I would actually have like two different strategies around how I would approach this. It definitely comes back to relationship management for either strategy that they do talk about. But what really comes to mind is, and I'm not sure if you remember this, Tim, like this quote that was back, I think it was like the quote was like back in 2019 or something. It was on LinkedIn Mm -hmm. everywhere. You couldn't escape it. But it was basically a conversation between a CFO and a CEO. And the CFO talks to the CEO and says, what happens if we invest in developing our people when they leave us? And the CEO says, well, what happens if they don't and they stay? Mm -hmm. And that's what this kind of reminds me of is going to be like, what exactly are we doing here? Because we could get into some dangerous waters by not being able to properly conduct research and go through with these types of uh, motions. And also at the same time, too, we can try to think about this as far as we're trying to highlight an example about what could go really well, so we have two potential strategies of like, what would be the dangers then the pitfalls if we don't do things correctly? And also, what can we actually make as like a champion example if we crush it and things go absolutely well? And to me, this depends upon the person who we're working with. So whether it's uh, your boss, the subject matter expert, you know, who whoever it really is, I want to be able to know a little bit more about them and see what drives them just from having these conversations conversations and really just being attentive and listening to exactly what really excites them, what makes them tick, what makes them kind of nervous. Because if you can use and highlight examples talking about, let's say, for um, highlighting the successes as far as pertaining to doing everything the right way and then showcasing about how the employees are incredibly happy, they leave positive reviews after reviews, the place gets voted as like number one place to work because of culture and awesomeness and the glass door uh, reviews are like off the charts and shows that the ROI is just incredible. Well, then we can go that way as far as for saying these solutions helped with what the L&D team did. Or you can do the opposite as far as we're saying, look at how these people did not do things correctly. And they just pitched idea after idea and they went nowhere, basically seeing what sticks up against the wall. And now people hate it. The culture is abysmal. People are quitting. Lawsuits are flying out. So whatever would potentially make that person move in that right direction to try to get them for you to be able to actually go and pitch new ideas, conduct your real research, get your amount of time that you really do need. I would kind of try either one, potentially whatever might might work. So that's what I was kind of thinking about when I read that question. Yeah. And and another thing to, to think about, too, is uh, I'm sensing a little frustration on, on the, the questioner's uh, part here, but maybe that just might be your role in the group. Um, having had multiple experiences, I've, I've worked at a, a small community college, and I've worked at now at, at ASU, a, a very behemoth of a university. Um and, and one of the things that I've experienced is that just because you're not doing the A and D portions of Addy doesn't mean they're not being done somewhere. Uh, oftentimes, mm-hmm. especially in a, a much larger institution, by the time it gets to the ID, there have been focus groups and, and maybe even a year of meetings and things like that doing these other kind of uh, processes of deciding, is this where we want to invest and things like that. So um, I'm, I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening in your in your situation. Uh, but that could be what's happening in your situation. And there are those times where we are just uh, the end of a line rather than, than the whole process. So then to that point, what suggestions would you have for them to try to be able to get in the know, to meet those right people and to hear that information instead of getting it way at the end of the process right. as far as for them being at the beginning of the process? Any steps you would, you would advise from there? Uh, that's that's uh, networking, relationship building. Um, it's still... Back to that first answer of make suggestions. Uh, Once people start seeing you as a person that has ideas and that has good suggestions and has good reasons for them, um, then you'll slowly get brought into those meetings uh, earlier in the process. Yeah, it's definitely networking. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of the things I should have actually like warned you about, Tim, is that I ask a lot of questions. (laughs) I'm asking questions that you didn't have prepared ahead of time. So I'm going to throw stuff at you. Uh, But it's because I really respect your opinion for how much you've been able to do in this field. So I'm always really curious about your insights. But that's the exact same thing I would have said about as far as for networking, as far as for really being able to also one of the 
um, activities that I have some of my students do from uh, leadership programs, which is really interesting, is trying to be able to create like a stakeholder map as far as we're seeing like who in the company has the key decision, like who is the person that talks to whom on lunch, who is right. the, like the influencer. And sometimes they're actually people who you would never, ever guess. Like I can right. confidently tell you that if I have a question about how my organization runs, I don't go directly to like the senior director of the blah, blah, blah. I actually start first with the administrator who I see in the morning as I'm walking by in the front desk and saying hi, because they mm-hmm. know everyone. They talk to every person. They know every person's kid's names and their dog's name and who goes. to. So it's like that person has the knowledge. Like I want to become best friends with that person (laughs) because then I can learn so much more. And then then you can figure out those right stakeholders and whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah, that is my that is one tip that I, I learned a while ago. So I think we got this question down. So why don't we move on? to question two and start to tackle that one. So this says, Hey Luke, thanks for connecting. I have seen some of your videos and wanted your advice. I have a proposal from a university for the role of instructional designer, and it's a new role to them, but they need me to train the professors to do basic e-learning themselves. Do you think this will work? And how is it working with faculty as subject matter experts and developers? Thank you. So this one, Tim, I have strong feelings on. Yeah, go Would, for it. So you want me to tackle this yeah. one first? So what I was actually thinking about this is because I have actually done this before um, in the past life. So like to answer the immediate question about do I think it can work? Like it can. It doesn't mean that's an absolute it's going to work, though, because you need to have the professors to be able to buy into this idea, which typically means that this whole new like it potentially this could be like a sweeping reform about how we're going to ask people to do this, where it needs to come from the senior level leadership from both sides of the story, from the instructional design department, as well as whoever is overseeing with these groups of um, instructors, whether it's going to be a team lead or whether these are full-time faculty members and this is more like the dean from the department. If they're really serious about doing this, we need this buy-in and we need this to be like a actual big deal about how this is going to be new for training and learning and this is going to be a whole new commitment and a whole new process because I had this happen at uh, when I worked at Northeastern University where a lot of the professors who I was working with, it was their very first time that they were actually setting up courses in Blackboard and they just had questions. And I mean, questions upon questions. And it really did feel like it was hurting cats at at, a number of times where I was like, oh my God, but also understanding that like this kind of was just brought to their attention of like, hey, your course is going online. This is what you agreed to, but we need you to do a certain amount of steps. And it definitely took quite a bit of training for them to just to get comfortable with a learning management system, not mm-hmm. even talking about like an authoring tool or something like that, but just like the basics as far as for saying that this is how you are going to be uploading your syllabus. Here's what a syllabus should actually contain. These mm-hmm. are where you're going to be putting your different things as far as for PDFs. This is where the discussion board posts go. This is how you respond to discussion posts. Like it became a full blown training session over weeks and months to try to really be get um, people to be able to do this. So Mm -hmm. that was just a learning management system. And it took me quite a bit of time. If you're asking somebody because the questions talked about um, like e-learning and authoring tools, if we're going down the road though, of like something way more complicated about diving on into storyline or using like something like that, then we are really going to get into some tricky and trouble waters here because I'm starting to get concerned about what the professors are going to think and what are their perspectives. Because Mm -hmm. if they say that they're already bending over backwards for their job and then now it's expecting them to be a professor, a facilitator, an e-learning developer and stuff like that, uh, it's going to go poorly. It's not mm-hmm. going to go well. And unfortunately, that resentment is going to go to you, the instructional designer. It's not <laughs> going to go the to the dean. Have, you're, you're the right. face in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> you, you are the deliverer of the bad information. So you are going to get that hate, which obviously is not fair to you. But like you're the one picking up the reins here. And in the question, too, it said that instructional design is new. Um, to them in this organization, which already Mm -hmm. makes me feel like you're going to be at a disadvantage from a power 
uh, standpoint and perspective within the hierarchy of the organization. No one's going to know who you are. Most likely, they have no clue about instructional design. And then here you are being like, so, hey, this is what we're going to do to make these courses better. Right. They can go along. It, it's, it's something that could potentially get really tricky, and it might take a long period of time. And they may entirely... Um, dismiss the instructional designer. So once again, it can work, but it has to come from the right people. The right buy-in has to be established and then the right training protocols need to come about. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I took a little bit of a different approach here. This yeah, is, a job, right, that, cool. this is cool. a job that I would love to have. Um, this is the way I prefer to work with faculty. Uh, and so my, my shorter answer is yes, this is, can absolutely work and it can be really enjoyable and really effective. Um, and, and it might go back to someone even posted just this morning in, in the, one of the Facebook groups about this idea that people are claiming that e-learning is just one thing or that e-learning is, I mean, that, uh, that ID is just one thing and, and, and it fits this very narrow definition. Um, you know, Instructional design is so many different things, um, and it sounds like in this case, what they're really wanting to hire is a is a professional development person, right? Um, and and if and if they can do that, then this is a great way to scale, and this is a great way to improve teaching and learning across your campus, improve uh, the online teaching and learning at a, at a larger scale. Because if if you're just an ID that is like that end of the line person, or that's more into the e-learning development side, like you said, storyline or, or developing Camtasia videos or things like that, then, then you have a capacity, right? You, you can develop two, maybe three courses a term uh, at a time. Um, but if you're doing this kind of consult model, which is, which is what I call it, you know, maybe you can consult on, on 12 courses at a time where you're meeting with faculty and saying, here's some, here's some training on, on the LMS, here's how to make a more efficient uh, discussion board, Here's a, a nice way to use Google Slides to make an interactive presentation. Now go do it. Now I meet with the next person. Um, and so you're, you're training them. You're giving them the tools. You're giving them the context of your experience. But then you're kind of sending them off to do their homework and to do the work. Um, and I love it. I mean, that's, that's, that's my style. I like um, that idea of professional development. Because now you're not only influencing that course that they're teaching. You're influencing every course they teach because you've given them a new tool or you've given them a new perspective. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're thinking of it from that, that perspective, if you're looking at it from a professional development, um, online teaching, coaching kind of position, um, then yeah, it can be very, very effective. So in your opinion, if you're going to be potentially taking this job, because it sounds like this was like, it, it was in the conversational piece that like it was just happening. They were going back and forth and things. One of the things that I'd be really curious about from that person's standpoint is what is their definition of success? Like, how do you know that I'm doing a good job as far as mm -hmm. my performance evaluation? Because from my past experience of trying to be able to do this, I am confident in saying that it's going to be like only half will care the first year. And then eventually the second year is more people tell other people it's going to spread and grow and, and your name will get out there and, mm -hmm. and instruction on design will be able to be talked a bit more about in a uh, more highly favorable light. At the beginning, though, it's going to be kind of rough to see like, hey, people aren't listening to me. They're mm -hmm. not doing what they say. Or maybe they will because the because the organization has said, we're doing this like yeah. you have the authority. Go do the thing. Would you be asking those questions, though, when you're like trying to go through that interview negotiation process? Yeah, absolutely. Is there a, is there an institutional desire to improve? Um, is this being backed at the dean's office at the at the director level somewhere above? Uh, or is this something that's being mandated on them that they're not interested in? Right. Uh, if that's a, a very different thing, too. Um, an analogy that comes to mind is like bicycling in a very high gear. Right. If you're in a low gear, it's easy to get started. You can crank out work, but you have a, like a maximum speed. You have a high gear. You, uh, you, it's, it starts slowly, but you can ramp and, and continue and, and continue to accelerate, right? Um, and I, I see it a little bit that way, too. It, and your comment to it, it may take some time to develop a rapport and to develop, mm. you know, get your name around and things like that. Um, I heard this phrase once, and it was in the context of um, accessibility, but I think it works just in general of professional development and in, and in uh, instructional design and e-learning development, this idea of taking a plus one approach. If each, if each instructor I, I can work with, I can give them one thing to improve their course and then they go do it. 
as soon as they see that that improved their course, then they come back to me for more things. Um, whereas if I give them 10 things, um, and, and the, and even if they only have time to implement one, they feel like they failed. Um, and they feel frustrated because, you know, Tim gave me all these things and I wasn't able to do only half of them, you know? Um, so that's one of the things I, I've learned in this kind of uh, coaching or this kind of consulting role is to not overload with information, not overload with tasks or tools or, or skills. Um, but in it, it, it becomes my job to listen to their story, listen to their course, identify and, and do all those analytical things while they're talking to me and say, this is the thing, this is the one thing that I think will have the most impact in your course. Let's implement this. And then in, in the spring, we can try something different or, you know, um, and, and then let that evolve. Makes sense. It, it makes sense. And to also make sure that I don't just leave a total negative spin on my past prior life, whenever they actually did do things. And then, as you said, they started to believe in themselves. The confidence came about, they stopped coming to me over time because they knew they could just, they, they felt confident enough to take the reins and say, I mm -hmm. can do this. And then they came to me if there was real problems. But right. once they actually got trained, it was very satisfying to yeah. see that professor so-and-so who's been at the institution for 50 years, all of a sudden is talking about online learning in a positive light was mm -hmm. really cool. That was, yeah. and as an instructional designer, you have the tools to be an excellent trainer uh, because you know, you can model the things that you want them to use. So if, if you want them to use more interactive video, send them an interactive video of how to use their LMS. If you want them to be involved and have better discussion boards, start a Slack channel or start a discussion board where faculty can share ideas. You know, I, I really like that idea of, of modeling the techniques that you want them to implement and that way they're learning and they're learning about learning. I dig it. I dig it. What a nice, positive, happy feel <laughs> to that <laughs> one. But it's true. It's true. It's cool. All right. Let's go into question three, because I feel like this one might be a long one, because many, many people have questions on this. So here we go. So question three says, hey, Luke, I've been a teacher for about nine to 10 years, and I'm looking to transition into instructional design. I am trying to figure out where to start. From what I am looking up, it seems as though I do not need any more schooling or certifications. Is that correct? Also, I was wondering if you had a step-by-step -step guide to creating a portfolio. I was going to help my friend, who is an immigration lawyer, design her website and use that as launching my portfolio sample. What do you think? Thanks in, adv uh, thanks in advance, and thank you for the advice. Tim, there's a lot of places we can go with this one. Would you like to take a crack at the beginning, and then I'm sure we're going to go into a lot of directions from there. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And having done this process myself, um, I trans, I taught K-12 uh, for 15 years. Um, also teaching graduate courses at the same time before even, I even knew that instructional design was even a career path for me. Um, but my, my first advice is, is start developing assets for your classroom. Start with what you already have. Um, you know, and he, he or he or she doesn't say what uh, subject matter they teach or what grade level, but it doesn't matter. If you, you know, you teach kindergarten, you know, make a cool YouTube video about, you know, the alphabet or about sounding out your vowels or a, a math video, um, you know, create a, uh, a Kahoot or uh, some kind of Pear Deck kind of interactive experience that your kids can do on the whiteboard or things like that. Start building things that your students can do uh, and then just take those pieces and that demonstrate your skills, right? That's what, that's what a portfolio is meant to do. It's meant to demonstrate and illustrate skills. Um, so start with what you have and start doing things that are going to benefit you both in your current position. And then you'll start over time collecting this portfolio of, of things that you built, built a, uh, build a, a classroom website or things like that. So, um, that's where I would start as a, uh, as a teacher transitioning into ID implement your ideas in your own because you've got, you've got the benefit of, of being an ID, a SME and a developer and having a captive audience, right? Right there. You have the microcosm of all instructional design right in your classroom. Um, so, so build and practice and, and build up that portfolio just with that stuff. Even if it's just, like I said, kindergarten, third grade stuff, that's, that's stuff. It, it still demonstrates a capacity. Um, and then it's up to you later on to, to make that connection of, hey, I built all these things and I can do the same for your, you know, your university program as well or for your, your corporate training or whatever it is. It totally makes sense. And the thing that I thought about when I first 
read this question is because like the because the overarching question too that I want to make sure that I definitely do touch upon is that it was this like, do I go back to school? Do I need certifications? Do I need the whatever? And the thing is, is that once again, there is no absolute answer to say, yes, you need the thing or no, you don't need the thing. It's very much, in my opinion, a preference for the person. But it really also comes down to as far as for how do you actually like to learn and knowing yourself? So if, cause like the thing is, is that, and as you know, as you've gone through this process yourself too, it's just like, if you want to go and Google or YouTube and read anything online for free from all fantastic resources, you can, you, you can teach yourself anything online for free. Mm-hmm. So I saw, I see some people on LinkedIn feeling like very strongly like against school or academies or certs or something. And it's just like, right. but if that person knows themselves well enough to say like, I know I'm going to struggle. I need someone to hold me accountable. I really need guidance because I'm lost. I'm confused. It's like, well, then there's your answer. If you want to go down that path, you can. But once again, if you want to go, if you've already been doing this for 10 years, you probably already have, I'm assuming, a degree in education or something related you already have mm-hmm. as Tim mentioned all of these different forms of samples and things you can start to create then it then maybe then you'll be totally fine you know like it's not like you must go get a master's if you prefer and you want to do that i would never stop you but like this is something to always consider i'm always thinking about the return on investment mm-hmm. like the iroi as the person like if you go back to school, is it really going to help you in the long run? Do you foresee what you want to be able to do or all the jobs that you are looking at say that you need X, Y, Z certification, degree, qualification, whatever, then like, okay. But right. I've known plenty of people who have not, and they've transitioned from teaching into instructional design and work at some incredible organizations right now. And what it really took was, as you were talking about, building out that portfolio, really showcasing what it is that they can really do. And they were able to do amazing things. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, yeah. It's and like I said, it's up to us to demonstrate skills and experience and to make the connection of how that's applicable in the job we're applying for. Um, If your portfolio or your resume doesn't demonstrate or the skills and experience don't fill everything, then that's where more, more training comes in. Um, you know, get, get that master's degree. That's a great way to get more skills and more training, uh, and more experience. Um, and and like you said, there are sometimes, um, what's the word, like benchmarks, minimums that you have to hit on a, on a job application. I've, I've applied for a job before where I felt like I could do a great job. Um, and one specific like minimum requirement I didn't meet and I, I didn't click the box on the, uh, on the application and I didn't even get an interview. And I thought "Eh, I could have just clicked the box and I would have at least got an interview. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's up to us to figure out that out, you know, what are the skills and the, and experiences we can demonstrate? What are those that we can't? And how do we fill those gaps in someone, like you said, someone that already has a, um, a master's degree in education, probably doesn't need another master's degree, but maybe a maybe an ID certification if their master's degree wasn't in ed tech or wasn't in curriculum development or something along those lines. Again, there's so much the Venn diagram of instructional design, e-learning, curriculum design, all these things um, is, is so complex. So just, you know, figure out if there are gaps, then then fill them with something, either a degree or a training or or an, an internship or other things. Like you said, go learn. And again, it comes mostly down to that portfolio. Um, we've hired, hired people recently that had a great portfolio, even though they didn't have as many degrees as somebody else, uh, because they showed that they could do the work and, uh, that they showed their, their work had something to it, that there was a, a level of quality or a certain perspective or things like that too. Um, so yeah, I would focus on the, on building that portfolio. And if you need to supplement your training, supplement your training. Uh, absolutely. So uh, two comments to that. The first is that I'm right there with you for like, I've applied to jobs where I was like, I am so good. I'm so perfect for this job. And then because we're going through like ATS and everything, but I didn't click on the box, but they're mm-hmm. like, Nope. And I was like, but I promise I swear I can do it. Yeah. Like it's like, and it was an instant denial email too. It right. was like, it, it immediately came back. I was like, it's, it's been five. What? It's been five minutes. Like, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's got, it's always kind of interesting. So for all of you who keep on applying, even like you get like those instant denials, we've all been there. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Keep, keep on going. It's unfortunately um, a part of that process. And also for portfolios too, because we've definitely hired instructional designers um, over the years on the team as well. And I am confident in telling you that like, I will, if you submit your resume to me and there's a link in the portfolio or a section in there, I will 100% dive on into that. 
And if that trumps whatever else, I'm going with that. Like mm-hmm. that, that is the thing that I really care about. And also on the flip side, if your portfolio is just a screenshot with no explanation of anything, then I'm like, I have no clue what I'm looking at. So when you think about a portfolio, because they asked too about like, like, like a, a guide for what's in mm-hmm. a portfolio. And, and there's definitely, once again, there's plenty of things on YouTube and Google that you can go and find, but mainly just to like break things down really quick is that I want to see your mindset around a project from start to finish from the very, very beginning. As far as we're talking about going through with the research, the analysis, defining the problem, and then coming up with your solution and then figuring out exactly how you design the overall thing. What were the methodologies? What were you thinking about from a learning strategy, perspective, Mm -hmm. philosophy, going through of how you develop that one. And then from there, talking about uh, not just the build, but also the evaluation. What were the results? What were the learnings? What were the findings? What would you do differently the next time? And then you can show me all the cool bells and whistles and like how it actually looks and works and stuff like that. But I care so much more about the back end and the inner workings of things. Like that's what I want to read and hear and see. And then if you Mm -hmm. make it into the interview phase and we're asking you about your portfolio, like we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. It is 100% going to come up where if like if you're walking us through something, we can say like, tell us more. Like, how did you create that? What did you do here? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do X? Like that's, that's the talking point that's going to get you to open up and get people to actually look at you in a much closer lens and say like, oh, they really know what they're doing. I can see what's going on here. Yes, that would fit onto the team. We do similar things and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's what I would advise for a portfolio piece. Yeah, I like the idea of an annotated portfolio. So even if it is just screenshots, then maybe call out bubbles or maybe captions on things or mouse over things and pop ups or, you know, keep it or keep it simple and just do like a screencast where you walk through and talk about things. Um, but I like what you said about focusing on the problem solution kind of dynamic. Here's the yeah. problem we had. Here's how, how we solved it. Or here's a challenge we had. Here's how we solved it. Um, shows yeah, a lot yeah. about your, your mindset and and uh, and the way you approach that. Right, exactly. That I want the mindset. I want mm-hmm. to know the inner workings of how this all came to be because I'm not unfortunately I've reviewed portfolios before where someone just sent me a screenshot of something in Canva and I'm like, okay. And yeah. what? what did you like, do what? here? Yeah. <laughs> right, like, I don't I was like, cool. Did pretty you find picture. all these stock images or did you do the photography yourself? Right. Or yeah. I was like, <laughs> I have no clue what this means. Like, please help me understand. And then of course, if you are going through with um, you know, trying to actually apply, and then you think obviously you only have your own perspective because you're applying and you're going through with things like much like I was saying, they're like, Oh, I'm perfect for the job and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But you don't know on the back end is that probably 90 other people applied to the same job. So now they're really trying to look through those nitty gritty details to say like, what makes this person stand out? And of course, if your portfolio really does showcase your skill set, your mindset and everything you can do, that's so much better compared Mm -hmm. to just being like, I have blah, blah, blah. And on your resume Mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah. yeah, and I, like I said, we just went through a hiring process uh, for a media designer, not a not an ID, but um, but it was it was surprising to me how many of the portfolios looked just all the same. I mean, they were yeah. they were fine. The the the, the work was was good, it, but it all looked the same. And then there were like three that stood out, and those were the three we interviewed. Yep, there you go. <laughs> it makes plenty of sense. And yeah. what I'll do as well too is that I'll. I'll as I'm popping up the link, I'm making a little note for myself. What I can do is that I'll include in the notes for this show, by the way, that I've been working with a colleague, Ala, and she has been absolutely crushing it with her portfolio, and it looks outstanding. It goes through the steps that uh, Tim and I talked about today on the show. So I'll be sure to link that down below so that that way you can actually see an example of what something looks like, where if I was the hiring manager for you and I saw that, I'd be like, ooh, like, what is that? Like, let me, let me dive on in. So that mm-hmm. way... Folks have a visual and they can go through things. The um, Dear Instructional then, Designer podcast also has a whole, did she do a whole season on building your portfolio or a series? Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that so whole thing's amazing. A, a great resource to dig into. Oh, yeah. Oh, that entire podcast is incredible. The all, all of, uh, there's like 50 something episodes, I think. I, maybe more. I don't, I don't recall. It's been a while but since I listened to that podcast. But that mm-hmm. one is a stellar podcast to be able to listen to. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say, if you wanted a real life uh, scenario around this too, there is our podcast episode with Side A 
and Eric, and she talks about how she reached out to Eric in order for her to be able to get a portfolio piece uh, done because of the fact that he kept posting on LinkedIn about trying to help people to tra transition out of academia into the corporate world. And he kept on making LinkedIn posting after posting. And finally, she was just like, hey, can I help you make a training around this instead? Mm -hmm. And they came on the podcast to talk about how their working relationship came to be, the communication, how things actually worked from a project management standpoint. So if you are working with a friend, which is what it sounds like that this person described, is that they're going to be working with a friend potentially on this type of a new uh, uh, on a, a new project well mm -hmm. then that way that's something else you can actually think about too as far as you're hearing more about what they did what worked what communication really came into be uh, mm -hmm. and also what didn't work because I asked them too I was just like so like where did things fall off the rails because like I want to know <laughs> what actually happened how did you right. fix those problems while still making sure that you are being uh, you know polite and appropriate and all that good stuff right. so they they dive into that so I'll include that into the notes as well too mm -hmm. and i like the idea of him working on this uh this law website but one of my my note there was this only demonstrates um a single subset of skills right uh mm. th it might demonstrate your your web design your ux design the ability to see from the user's experience you know some maybe some graphic design and, and typography maybe or you know it, but it it, it, it doesn't show anything about learning science. It doesn't show anything about uh, e-learning tools or, or maybe in, um, interactions or you know, online interactions or those kind of things too. So it definitely could be part of your portfolio. And if that's the first part of your portfolio, great. But then try to identify what needs to supplement that. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. That's an excellent end to question three. And now comes question four, Tim. And this is the one that... I've spent so much time <laughs> researching. I was like, this is not easy trying to figure out how to go down and, and, and go. So, so I'm really curious to actually hear what you said about this one, because I, I have my own thoughts and feelings on here and apologies to everyone before I read this question, because there's a lot of names on here. I'm going to try to shorten them because I am the worst when it comes to pronunciating names. Uh, so I'm just going to horrifically butcher everyone's name. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak for Luke and say, they'll probably be in the show notes. Yes, they will. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to accept all of these names. Uh, so, okay, here, here is the question. It says, hey, Luke, I saw your post about wanting questions for your podcast, and I've got one. I'm working on a project looking at effective design for online discussion boards at the graduate level and came across a different measurement scale, interaction analysis model, or short, it is IAM. Have you ever heard of it? So far, I found two papers that refer to it, Constructing Student Knowledge in the Online Classroom, The Effectiveness of Focal Prompts, and The Effect of Structured Divergent Prompts on Knowledge Construction. The authors in both papers make the point that using Bloom's taxonomy as a measurement scale isn't as reliable as the IAM scale. Do you have any experiences with the IAM scale? Is it really more reliable than Bloom's at determining and measuring critical thought level of student posts? So, Tim, this one's wild. This one is like really diving into the instructional design world where I saw that the first thing I actually thought about was this like, wow, this is so awesome that someone has the opportunity to really go down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Like that was the first thing where I was just like, this means that the institution or the organization like really believes in doing the best they care. They want to, the latest and greatest. So this actually made me really happy as far as for that goes. Mm -hmm. Then came the pain of trying to figure out how to answer this. <laughs> So I'm not. What, do you want to take this one first, or would you like me to give this thing a spin? Uh sure. Yeah. So, uh, so the IAM is 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 there's there's some some loaded questions there and some some interesting concepts. Um, the short answer is no. I've never heard of it before. Um, I've never used it, but. I love digging into these articles and, and then you also supplied a third article, which I thought w was a great way of, uh, gave a good framework of it. So I'm hoping that'll be in the notes too. Absolutely. Um, but the more I process this and, and again, this is me looking into this for the first time. So, uh, completely new perspective, but the more I process this, it almost, it, it's almost to me an apples and oranges kind of comparison. Um, when you're talking about blooms versus this, uh, this framework, um, what the uh, IAM 
is is intended to do from from what I could tell. It's a tool for measuring the level of interaction in an online environment. Okay, so it's it's specifically about measuring the interaction itself, the depth of the interaction, the quality of the interaction, and and it provides these five levels of of interaction. Uh, level one, uh, sharing and comparing. Level two, dissonance. Level three, negotiation and co-construction. Level four, testing tentative constructions. And level five, uh, statement and application of newly constructed knowledge. Um, and I really liked this idea because always we've, uh, I've talked with colleagues before about, you know, improving discussion boards. We're always trying to get past that third step of here's my thought. And then someone says, yeah, that's nice. Or, you know, no, you're wrong. Or how do you get to that third level of let's start now trying to get to this level, negotiation and co-construction. Um, so this fell right in line with my experience about discussion boards and, and my desire to get discussions better. And so I really, really like this framework. I'm going to, I'm going to be using this more for sure. Um, but it is specifically a framework for analyzing the, the, the depth of those interactions, not the content behind it. And my thought was, you know, I could read 10 papers, synthesize and analyze and analyze the content there, come up with a brand new learning theory. And if I state that on a discussion board, that's a level one interaction. So I've done, you know, the tippy top of blooms, um, construction analysis, you know, creation. Um, but that's still just a level one IAM interaction until someone comes in and says, uh, I don't think that's right. Have you thought about it this way? Okay, that's a level two interaction. Then when I say, okay, here's what I really meant, or, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, maybe it's this. Now we're getting to negotiation and co-construction, which is a level three interaction. So it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's, uh, it's there to measure the quality of the tool you're using, really, the quality of that discussion itself. And it's and going off of that, it's also tricky to really know what people actually mean and say and do within a discussion board section mm -hmm. because it's it's so it's from the outside looking in because i know i read a bunch of different papers around this too that was talking about literally like downloading the transcripts of the course mm -hmm. and analyzing that and it's just like well like how much did you really understand because you're the outsider looking in like what like if you had the conversation with the person you may have perceived and interpreted things differently compared to the instructor compared to another student so there's to me there's a lot of wiggle room where mm -hmm. once again i love the idea like i i think it's great for us to be able to say hey we can make these things better let's take about these let's talk about these different types of phases and really try to see how can we make a richer fuller more meaningful conversation in a discussion board that's awesome so like i really do like this even though mm -hmm. i'm kind of like poo-pooing it but like I, I really love the idea of things but the other big thing to me that I kept on thinking about because I've taken online courses for forever. I've taught graduate courses for years too. And what I know is that if I really was going to say like, I'm doing this research, I want to make sure I'm going to dive on into everything and whatnot. I really need to understand the student's perception about discussion boards specifically for that course, that institution. And same thing with the professor's perceptions about discussion boards, because mm -hmm. we have all been there where people go into a discussion board and they're like, all right, cool. This is 2% of my grade. I need two paragraphs. You got it. And they just start typing away because it's not weighted to say this is half your grade. So right. they're going to spend more of their time doing the full blown assignments and essays and projects and whatnot and so forth, because that's natural to do. Because if you have, if you bomb all the discussion boards and you still get a 90% of the class, whatever, you know, like, yeah. where's like, my motivation? Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that level of motivation has to be there. And of course you have grad students, which is great. I think grad students are the right pilot to do this because mm -hmm. typically other adults care about this communication, the connectivism, that sh like they should be caring about the discussion. So I think it's a really good way for us to be able to pilot, see how it goes, find the right instructors as well too, who really would be able to support this and partner with the instructional designers. Because mm -hmm. once again, I've taught grad courses and I am confident in telling you that if I am trying to go and do my announcements, do my grading, and then on top of that, try to contribute to half the discussion board posts per week, I'm looking at 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and if that's what you're trying to be able to say is like, we want richer conversations, really do this, really do that. It's like, I get it, 
But we also need to think about the realistic perspective is that if these are adjunct inst uh, instructors, if they're making $2,200, $2,500 for a 10-week course, really, like, are they going to say, like, I'd love to spend more time and have, like, a deeper conversation of a discussion board? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's more about perceptions and reality than it is as much about, like, hey, this sounds great, but we need the right circumstances to really test it out. Right. Does and that we need sense? to provide, yeah, we need to provide our students the right circumstances as well. I think yes. one of the biggest issues that I, that this brought up for me was we don't ever give our students enough time to get past. Yeah. If we can get to that third level, that's amazing. We don't give them enough time uh, because too often we treat a discussion board as an assignment, a task that has a certain amount of time, like it's week two discussion board or it's the discussion board for chapter nine. You know, and as soon as we move on to chapter 10, the chapter nine discussion board is irrelevant anymore. Um, and it, it really made me think about, you know, maybe uh, it would be fun to try a model where the discussion board lasted all the term. Right. So that you could get past level two, level three. And, and maybe it, discussion boards are just for topics. And throughout the course, those topics can continue to, to develop and mature. And, and and now that I have like an actual tangible framework that I can print out and, and staple onto my board and look at all day, um, you know, that's sets that goal of I'd really like to see a student get to or a, a class get to level five interactions on a discussion board. That would be amazing. But that's going to take time. That's going to take two, three weeks uh, because because it's really about those cycles. When we have people in a room together, the amount of cycles that happen, communication cycles that happen are huge. I mean, even in this conversation, we've had maybe a hundred or more back and forth cycles of, of ideas and questions and things like that. Um, in a discussion board, that would take a month to have hmm. that equivalent conversation. Um, and we just don't give our students that amount of time. No, because they need that time to also build those relationships too. Mm -hmm. like they, they, don't, they don't know each other yet. So mm -hmm. when I think about like, oh, like, are you hitting the uh, negotiation stage? Well, I was like, well, if I don't know this person at all, no, I'm not. No, that's, yeah, that's I don't not know. appealing are to me. Are they going to take it wrong? Or, you know, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do I, am I going to get you know, a complaint against me because I'm debating against this person and now we're fighting, quote unquote, in a discussion board and it's really weird and awkward and tense? Like, no, I don't mm -hmm. want to do that. You know, right. like, but of course, it's just like, oh, no, I've known this person now for eight weeks and we've had a bunch of calls together. We've gone through things together. Then like, yeah, I'm not afraid to push back because I will respectfully do so. And they know me. They know my style. It's not going to catch someone by surprise, which also makes me think too entirely about like, is a discussion board enough? Because I don't think so. If I was if I really wanted to do this model, it would be like, yeah, we're going to have a discussion board, but also we're going to do weekly uh, workshops or trainings or webinars or something where we're going to be coming together as a group and working together, either mm -hmm. in person, Zoom, Gather Town, whatever, something yeah. video ish. Platform -ish. Yeah. Or how do you get one discussion board to bleed into the next so that it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. instead of starting over each week, it can, can somehow evolve? And that's one of the things I like. Um, some of these platforms like, uh, like Yellow Dig uh, or uh, Packback uh, that, that kind of allow for yellow dig especially is modeled after facebook it's one board that students interact with each week throughout the term um and so it could it could allow students to continue a thread that started in week one throughout uh if they if they're engaged in that topic or engaged in that thread um the other thing that stood out to me too was this idea of dissonance um, being uh, being an advanced form of <laughs> an advanced form of communication that 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 we hear a lot about um, the algorithms in our social media that funnel us toward people that agree with us right uh, that, that, that that's typically the the idea in YouTube or in Facebook or things like that is that we are funneled toward places that we will agree and engage because engagement's the key there right um, and this idea of dissonance is an interesting one. And I know that there's one platform, I think it's Ment.io, um, that is using AI in their discussion board platform specifically to create some dissonance. Like they may, their AI will try to, I don't know exactly how it works. I saw a demo one time. I haven't used it myself, but will try to put in front of you uh, posts or comments that, that might seem not in alignment with your own. Um, oh, interesting. So that so that instead of funneling you towards agreement, it kind of funnels you toward disagreement or toward um, uh, toward this area of dissonance to to get you to that next level. 
Um, so I thought that was an in- interesting use of, of AI within a, within a discussion board. I'm really intrigued by how some of these companies are starting to use AI in their discussion board platforms. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. If someone can actually do that and I'm, I'm literally like looking at this like right now uh, on, on the side. So that's interesting. I'm going to dive into that and I'll, I'll clearly I'll link that into the show notes as well. Um, the other thing that this completely reminds me of, too, is did you ever take a debate class before in college? I never did. So I've taken a few and I'm confident in telling you that like week one is really weird because you're like, I don't know these people, whatever. And then, of course, like the first class I had, it was some we, we went through all the, the typical debates that you would think about. And, of course, the professor would say, like, what side are you on, A or B? And then, mm-hmm. like, whatever hand that you raised up for, he was like, awesome. You're on the opposite side. Congrats. Like, go mm-hmm. fight with yourself. And you're like, right. cool. Now I have to see the other perspective and debate myself and try to convince other people. And I remember um, one of the ones that we were talking about was uh, something like lowering the drinking age to like 18 is like what, what I had. And I was all like the opposite. I was like, no, we should have lowered the drinking age. And of course, they were like, congrats, you're on the other side. And I was like, mm-hmm. ah, OK, here we go. You know, and that really had a deeper conversation because I mm-hmm. was debating with my fellow classmates about these things and you know, and some people were. Um, vulnerable and open about different things about how like these different forms of substances like affected their lives or their loved ones or whatnot. So like it created this huge thing where I was like, whoa, like I thought, I thought this is a surface level debate. We're not, mm-hmm. we're not going anywhere. And then all of a sudden all these stories came about and these emotions and, and it was like, oh, okay. So, but of course, once again, that was over a period of time. It right. was assigning you a belief and you had to go against one thing. So it's, So it's like, I can see this working, but it needs the time. It needs that uh, continuation that you've been talking about, the platform, the trust, the, it needs a lot to be able to do it. But, but once again, I love the idea. Mm -hmm. It just, you really need a lot of the right circumstances, but I think it's cool. I think it's worthy of of testing for sure. Yeah. The other thing I like about this, you know, you, you probably heard the the phrase uh, that which gets measured improves, right? Just the act of measuring something or being consciously aware or being able to uh, uh, put a number to something um, changes the way we approach it. I think that just more awareness of this, of this framework um, would have that kind of effect. You know, now that I, can look and and point to, like I said, a framework of interactions. Um, It kind of gives me a goal to work toward and and it makes it a little more concrete. So I'm really appreciative of whoever asked this question. Thank you. Um, (laughs) I learned a lot and it's made me think about the discussion boards a little bit different, but I really do think uh, to wrap it up, it is kind of apples and oranges. Uh, Blooms, uh, we, we often throw out the word blooms and we leave off all the rest of the words, right? Blooms, taxonomy of learning is really about putting a framework or a, a way to measure an individual's learning, right? Um, and and this is not that. This is measuring the depth of an interaction. So Absolutely. two different things kind of related. Um, uh, I'm not sure why those articles would try to pair them against each other when they're just different tools for different purposes. It, yeah, that, that yeah, great point. That was something I found interesting too. I was like, why, why the need of comparison? Because like, mm-hmm. it, it's plenty great on its own. Why are we trying to bring down other people? That's you know, it's kind of like how many you're reading about an instructional design model, and then you're like, cool, like I love using backward design. This works for me. And then someone's yeah. gonna come in here and then just like kick down the door and be like, have you heard of Sam? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, it's gr- well, yeah, sure, like it's sure. <laughs> it's fine. Like, what's what's the problem here? Like, why do we need to fight about it? It's uh, anyway, but. That's a yeah. different. That's a different story for a different day. Uh, Tim, this was awesome, yeah. man. This yeah, was this fun. Is great. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love doing this. I would hope that you would come back in the future to do more Q, uh, Q&A episodes because this was mm-hmm. really cool. I learned a lot, uh, not just from hearing from you, but once again, that last question, I was reading like journal after journal <laughs> article going through things where I was like, where is this going to stop? Like it just, it's like going back in grad school, trying to learn all these things new. Uh-huh. It was fun, man. It was, it was actually, it was, it was really cool. I had a great time. Uh, Tim, the final question I have for you is where can folks go to find you, connect with you, see what you do? Where do you want them to be able to connect with you? Oh, timothymckeen.com is my name uh, and my website for, for uh, audiobook and e-learning samples there. I uh, also have a channel on YouTube. Don't post there too often anymore, but uh, Find me on, on your Facebook group and, and around. Uh, everything is just based on my name. So look up Timothy McKean and you'll find it. 
Awesome. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes so they can easily access it. But Tim, hey, once again, thanks for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. It was a ton of fun. Also, a big thank you to Tim once again for coming on the show. If you have a question that you want featured on the podcast, write to me. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, email Luke at DrLukeHompson.com. I can be reached by pretty much any way. So find me, ask your question, and we'll love to have this come on the show and bring on more guests, other expertise, better perspectives to keep on diving on in and really unpack this entire instructional design field. If you like this video, if you like this podcast episode, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe to this channel, and of course, to comment down below and tell us what you thought about this episode. Any surprises? that came about or did you have a different take on any of our questions and any of our answers but hey folks that is all i have for you today stay nerdy out there and i'll talk to you next time